It's another episode of Startups the Rest of Us. I am your host, Rob Walling. In this episode of Hot Take Tuesday, in our Volset and Tracy Osborne join me to talk about Once.com, to talk about how a company sold for half a billion dollars and the founders got nothing, at least according to this article. A developer who went from open source to a full-time income. Then we give some book recommendations and have a lightning round of reactions to controversial startup opinions. Before we dive into that, I want to let you know it's your last chance to get tickets to MicroConf Atlanta. The event is April 21st through the 23rd. Speakers include Rand Fishkin from SparkToro, Asia Aranjo from Demand Maven, Stephen Steers, myself, and Dr. Sherry Walling. It's going to be hosted and emceed by me and Leanna Patch of Punchline Copy. I'm also going to be doing a fireside chat with Ben Chestnut, the co-founder of MailChimp. He does not do very many public appearances, and so I'm very excited to host him at MicroConf this year. MicroConf.com slash US if you're interested in grabbing tickets. Again, tickets are going to sell out soon. So if you're thinking about joining me and about 225 of your closest bootstrap founder friends, head to microconf.com slash US. And with that, let's dive into Hot Take Tuesday. Tracy Makes, back for another Hot Take Tuesday. I'm ready to fight with Anar. <laughs> yes, it's going to be great. Anar Volset, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We have some nice, fun, not at all spicy topics to jump into today. Kick us off. Once.com from 37 Signals, they're basically saying it's not software as a service, it's just software. No subscription, you download the code, you set up your VM, your virtual machine, or whatever it is. I'm sure they have, what is it, Docker containers and such. But is one-time software the best thing since Clippy? Best thing since Greedo shooting first? Tracy. I want your opinion on this. It's, I think it's good to have options, but there, I think there's a reason why the world moved towards SaaS. And, you know, you're looking at Once.com and their first product, Campfire. For anyone who has a technical team who wants to dive in and and do everything themselves, then this is a interesting idea to replace Slack. And for folks who just don't want to go in that direction, again, having the technical teams to do this because Campfire says... Free updates to any 1.x version. So that means that updates are going to end at some point. And this says bare bones support included. So there might be support, but most stuff you're going to have to figure out on your own. It's This is why for most folks, a SaaS product makes more sense for them, even if it does have that subscription model and that you know idea they're going to be paying for it forever and dealing with price increases and all that. I have other things to say about the... The product itself, Campfire, but um, yeah, it's. I'm glad to see there's other options. I can see that this being intriguing to a lot of folks, but not the majority of folks, and that's you know why people are paying out the butt for things like Slack. In our vol set, are we pivoting Tiny Seed to invest in one time? <laughs> why are you asking sale him? Software? <laughs> no, 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 we're definitely not. I have opinions but, um, about that too. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back. To I it. think part of this is sort of grows up with how you know after the Slack acquisition, we're now basically on the uh, Salesforce pricing type in the Salesforce pricing world. And so that means it's just going to get more expensive, you know, more quickly as we're finding out with MicroConf and TinySeed. And like, you know, people get shocked when I tell them what our Slack bill is just for TinySeed. And, and, and clearly there's space there for, I actually think Slack itself has sort of failed at, or, or maybe by choice, but certainly they, they, they don't cater well to this type of community, you know, sort of not really like a business and, you know, not completely volunteer, but this like halfway house where you want some of the features, but you're not like, it really doesn't make any ton of sense to be spending 50 or 100 grand if just for Slack software. And something like once comes along and, you know, if it's good enough and you pay $299 once or whatever the price is, then certainly that's very attractive from a consumer standpoint. You know, I, I sort of echo most of the stuff that, that Tracy says. I think it's, I think, I think maybe the, the, the base camp guys are kind of in a unique position, whether they realize quite how unique their sort of position with the fame and like their whole, it feels to me like their whole like marketing approach has been like, 
contrarian takes as marketing that's sort of been base camp sticks so like it doesn't surprise me that that a pricing effort like this comes from from base camp you know as much as i love them i know that they probably get a lot of attention every time they say something unusual or different so that f fits in with that pattern more than anything else i think i don't think it's a winning formula for your average startup you know indie hacker bootstrapper, tiny seed founder to be like, oh, screw it. Like, let's not charge 50 bucks a month or whatever. Let's just do $300 once. Like, we're already struggling hard enough to get founders to charge enough money of the value, like charge enough so that they, they capture some of the value that they create. Like, if this becomes like a, this is our standard, then, then that becomes even harder, I think. Yeah, for me, as both a founder and as a customer or consumer of software, I don't want once. And I get it. My opinion, I'm doing mere research instead of market research, but I used to own downloadable software that ran on a server. It was called .NET Invoice. And I will never go back because the headache of support was brutal. People would install it. And I people would install it on their own server or on a GoDaddy shared hosting account, and it wouldn't work, and it was their problem. They didn't care it was their problem. They would flame me. They would charge back. They would ask for a refund. They would do whatever, even though I was like, look, it's your thing. So then I'd spend an hour or two troubleshooting, finally be like, oh, your server's misconfigured here. And they're like, oh, sorry. And then they'd fix it. And so two hours of my time for a $300 yeah, yeah. You know, one time, although it was- Rob, Rob the IT consultant, oh, that's great. Well, I'm sorry, you're, 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 you missed, that, missed those days, that, don't you? I, not at all. So as a, as a, and it wasn't recurring, right? It was 300 one time and then I got 20% annual maintenance, right? So 60 bucks a year per- and I don't, I don't want to do that ever again. Like I know this long, slow SaaS ramp of death is a thing, but also it's recurring and it's my servers. And if there's a problem, I'm responsible for it, but it's my servers and I know that they're configured. I know that once says minimal support, but it's like, yeah, but come on, people are still going to flame you. They're still going to charge you back. They don't give a shit when you say minimal because they'll be convinced that it's your bug. It's your bug. And then guess what? It's not. But they don't care, right? Because right. people are idiots on the internet. And so I, I don't want it as an uh, entrepreneur. I also don't want it as a consumer. I would prefer to just, please just handle this. I don't want to spin up a, like I, I have enough trouble with, you know, we have a couple apps written in Python and it's like, I'm always like, where are those hosted? Do, does anyone have access to those? What if, what if they go down? What, you know, it's like <laughs> enough that we're, <laughs> Tracy chortles. So I don't know. I just, I, for me, it's like, as you said, I think it's a contrarian thing. I think it's an interesting experiment. I don't see, I do not at all see that it's where the market's going. Basically, the way that I think about it, it's, it's basically like you're basically like building in 100% monthly churn, <laughs> which like I, used to, I spend so much time thinking about how to reduce churn. Like the fact that you would design your software business model in a way that like, hey, let's have 100% churn every month. And with .NET Invoice, the first of every month, I had zero in revenue. And I was like, Ugh, I got to start from nothing. The only thing that worked was if I had ads running or SEO or some recurring traffic source, that was the only way to, to maintain, that, you know, for me, it was single digit thousands in revenue. Tracy, back to you. It doesn't make sense as a business model, in our opinions, I guess, for 37 signals. It doesn't make sense for large teams that are using Slack or Teams to switch to something like this because of the lack of support. And I have, I have some issues with the user experience as I've tried it out, I didn't like it. So this product really only works for maybe small, very savvy tech teams that wanna have control of their software. And how many of those are out there and what's gonna stop those people from doing something else like Slack free or Discord or anything else? It just doesn't seem like there's a, this is a problem where we're like, okay, Slack is super expensive. It's awful. People don't like it. They want a solution for this. But I don't see this one being the thing that fixes that problem. I heard Ian Landsman on a podcast. I forget what it was, but he was talking about the launch of this campfire launch with once. And I can't find the source of this, but he said that they had sold 800 copies in the first week. 800 times $300 is a quarter million dollars. With 37 signals reach... 800 copies just isn't that much. And it's not, look, I know how one-time sales go. The first week is the big week, and then it goes down from there. It usually doesn't go up, especially if it's audience-based. So it feels to me, I mean, $250,000 in revenue for them is a rounding error. And it doesn't feel like a success. That doesn't feel like a success. It's like, I don't know, I would think they would need to move a lot more copies for them to be over the moon. 
You should get the base camp guys on here to ask him how it went. Yeah. That should be, come on. Yeah, just invite him on and talk about it. Why not? Yep. They are Tiny Seed mentors and investors, so. Yes, and we love them. We love them for that. I want mm-hmm. a product like this to work, but it's like when you really dig into the folks that would use it, the product itself, the way it's sold, it's there's a lot of a lot of issues they're going to run into, and they probably have already run into at this point. Because I actually haven't heard many people talk about it since it launched either. Mm-mm. No. For our second topic of the day, I go to fundablestartups.com. The headline is sell for half a billion and get nothing. And the summary is that FanDuel was acquired for $465 million in cash, but due to liquidation preferences, the FanDuel founders and most employees received nothing in the massive deal. Anar, I'm going to kick it to you first on this one. Can you let our listeners know what liquidation preferences are and what happened in this deal? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know specifically what happened in this deal, but but as a general uh, concept, liquidation preferences are basically this notion that if an investor invests in your company, say they put $100,000 in and they have a 1x liquidation preference, what that means is basically that when you sell, they get at least $100,000 back if there is at least $100,000 back if it's a 1x liquidation preference. If there's a 2x liquidation preference, then they get at least double their money back. And if it's 3x liquidation preference, then they get three times their money back. And there are some nuances beyond that too in terms of like, is the liquidation preference participating or non-participating? So a non-participating 1x liquidation preference means the investor basically has to choose. Do they want 1x their money back or do they want to participate in relation to how much they owe of the company. So obviously, if the transaction is at less than the valuation, they'll exercise their liquidation preference to get their money back. If it's larger than that, then they will choose to participate alongside the investors and not get their liquidation preference back. If it's participating, then they get both. (laughs) So that means if it's a 3x participating liquidation preference means you get three times your money back as the investor, and then you participate based on your pro rata share of the of the equity. So it can be quite, you know, if you don't know what you're talking about, like if you don't know what you're doing, then it, it can be to the point where sort of unintentionally you didn't really realize that actually the investors are getting their share plus 3x and you didn't know that. Uh, and that might materially impact the, the actual money that you put in your pocket at the end of the day. So with, with this one, uh, I think, like I, I saw this come around for some reason, it was back on Twitter, like, the last couple of weeks and i was always like the headline was this like here's how you like sell your business for a billion dollars and make zero and i was like this there's just no way on green god's green earth that's actually accurate and and actually i think data's come out later that actually so usually what happens in these kind of situations is you're selling for less than the liquidation preference of your latest investors but a lot of the time most of the time and also in this case like you kind of want the existing management team and team to stay on because like if truly all the money does go directly to the investors, then what's the point of keeping working there? You know, you might as well just quit. And then the company, you know, gets run into the ground. So usually there's this notion of like a founder or management carve out as part of the transaction. So, you know, if they're selling for 500 million, they might carve out 50 million of that and say, okay, like 450 goes to the investors and they'll do whatever they need to do in terms of their liquidation preference or whatever. And then 50 gets carved out as like, you know, retention bonuses or whatever for the for the executive team. Now, what seems to have happened here is that the people who got truly got zero are the founder, the original founders, but the, those original founders were no longer with the company. And that that I can believe. Like if you are a founder and you basically signed a deal like this and you brought in whatever money, I think it's 275,000 in their latest, their latest series E round, then, and then you walk away, then yeah, I can definitely see how with the 2x liquidation preference, which is high, but not, you know, usurious or anything like that. I can definitely see how you end up with nothing. But I think what's also been lost in that situation is like, there's also no way that those founders didn't get a bunch of money at that series E. So the founders who walked away, I just do not believe that you get in a situation where you're raising a $275 million Series E from private equity and family office money, and you give up control. And so so basically, like, you agree to 2x liquidation preference and drag along rights, and then you take no money off the table as part of that transaction. That I don't believe. I, I am sure that the founders who are now suing already got paid a reasonable amount of money in 2015. I'd be shocked if not. And, and if not, then they are stupid and their advisors are even worse. Yeah, and so 
people listening might say, well, there should be no liquidation preferences. Those are predatory, <laughs> but they're not, right? So when Tiny Seed invests, if we write you a check for $120,000, we have a 1x liquidation preference. And what that means is if you tomorrow you were to sell your company for $200,000, we get our 120 back and then you get the rest. And it's to protect us because let's say we invest that 120 for 12%. If we didn't have a liquidation preference, you could sell it tomorrow for two hundred thousand dollars, and we'd only get twelve percent. We get twenty four grand back. So you could, you know, just screw us. So that's I. That's the case. At least I know why they exist. Yeah, there's a balance there, right? You have to have some level of investor protection, and different investors have different, just have different rights and different approaches to things. Like we, we can't have zero liquidation preference in part because we invest in so many founders. So we have the, you know, the full spectrum of personalities among our founders. And like, it, it just doesn't make any sense for a professional investor not to have at least a 1x non-participating liquidation preference, which is what we have. But there are other investors who basically have 3x liquidation preferences, you know. Tracy Makes, what are your thoughts on this? I wish I had Anar on my team when I was back the day at my startup and I was joining a accelerator and trying to decide whether I was um, going to take outside money. I talked about this in MicroConf 2016 is how I you know, met Rob because I, I started this startup and I went, I bounced back and forth on raising, thinking I was like, oh, oh I'm going to raise money. And then I was like, no, I'm going to go back to bootstrapping. And what actually happened is I raised money from this accelerator. A friend told me that this accelerator had, I want to say at least a 2x liquidation preference might have been three. And they were like, FYI, this could cause trouble in the future. And I, you know, I was dumb back then. I didn't, I was like, okay, I'll sign this anyways. You know, deciding not to raise money and going to bootstrapping. When I wanted to shut down the business and ideally I would like to sell the business so that I can move on and do other things like join Tiny Seed, because of those terms and liquidation preference and because I hadn't raised money and because the, the company was, I couldn't just like as a bootstrap business be like, all right, cool, I'm just going to give myself a $20,000 sale and have some money from that. But no, I had these this liquidation preference. I had this investor on board, you know, all these old terms. I would have to pay back two or three times what they invested in me before I would see anything. So it just I just had to shut down the business at that point. I got so many emails from people being like, why can't you just sell the business for peanuts and get a little bit of money? And I was like, it's because I won't because of this prior investor and the liquidation preference and all that kind of stuff. So it's anecdotally, but it's now I know more about terms and what to look out for when raising money. And hindsight being 2020, I wish that I, I heard for the grapevine that I could have negotiated that in some way, shape, or form. And I didn't do that. I just didn't know back then. And now now I understand like how I got into that situation. I just think a lot of founders, like a lot of founders just don't, they just look at the top line number. Like how much money am I getting yeah. in? What's the valuation money. and the story? And then they're just like, whatever, like, you know, this everything else will work out. We'll just make a shit ton of money. And then it doesn't matter. But like, it does matter. And like, really like investor behavior and their terms, particularly early on, really matters. Like it, it can materially impact your ability to fundraise. It can materially impact your ability to sell the company. Like there's lots of things with just making sure that the terms that you're getting are are reasonably balanced. Like it doesn't have to be super founder friendly. Like that zero X liquidation preference doesn't make any sense either. But like, you know, finding the right balance there, I think is I think is key. And I could see like an indie hacker posting this on Twitter and saying, see, funding, never, never raise funding. It's the devil. And it's like, that's not the lesson either, right? Funding is a tool. You don't say that a hammer or a shovel is a tool, but understand when they work and when they don't and understand what you're getting into. Understand which strings might be attached. Educate yourself, hire a good lawyer, and don't just sign paper because funding can get you there faster. And we see this with tiny C companies, you know, every day. So it's not that it's good or bad or indifferent. It is... Just a thing. And yes, there are predatory investors out there. But there are really shitty founders who try to screw their investors too. It cuts both ways. And so that's where liquidation preferences are a thing that's part of the ecosystem. I think it's, you know, it's not just understanding the term, but also understanding in different scenarios about what those mean, because there are scenarios where a certain term could make sense and there are scenarios where certain terms can, that, that don't make sense. And just being aware of where those are will make the future less make it easier to plan for the future because you know what direction to go to based on the terms that you have. There was a book 
we're going to talk about books later, but I want to talk about, um, was it the book Venture Deals? Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer and Venture Capitalist by Brad Feld. Um, that was something I read post my investment and in my prior startup that I wish I had read before I took that investment. Because I just, people told me it was predatory. I thought I kind of understood it, but that kind of broke things down in a way where then I really understood what those scenarios meant for me. Finding the perfect software engineer for your team can feel like looking for a needle in a haystack, and the process can quickly become overwhelming. But what if you had a partner who could provide you with over 1,000 on-demand, vetted, senior, results-oriented developers who are passionate about helping you succeed? And all that at competitive rates. Meet Lemon.io. They only offer hand-picked developers with three or more years of experience and strong, proven portfolios. With Lemon.io, you can have an engineer start working on your project within a week instead of months. Plus, you won't waste your time on candidates who aren't qualified. Lemon.io gives you easy access to global talent without scouring countless job boards, and it's more affordable than hiring local talent. And if anything goes wrong, Lemon.io offers swift replacements, so it's kind of like hiring with a warranty. If you need to grow your engineering team or delegate some work, give Lemon.io a try. Learn more by visiting Lemon.io slash startups and find your perfect developer or tech team in 48 hours or less. As a bonus for our podcast listeners, get a 15% discount on your first four weeks of working with a developer. Stop burning money, hire devs smarter. Visit Lemon.io slash startups. Our next story is titled, How I Turned My Open Source Project Into a Business. It is the business of email engine. And for me, I mean, it, it's an interesting story. You know, most people who start an open source project are not able to, to build a business around it. I believe it might even be supporting him full time. But the interesting part for me was he had the open source project and then it was under the AGPL license, which is extremely permissive. And then if you wanted an MIT license, then you had to pay him and it was 250 euro per year. And basically he was making nothing. Like a year and a half, he made 750 euro in total revenue. The big shift was basically saying, you need a valid license within 15 minutes after the app or it stops working. So he actually implemented like what we would think of as a time-limited SaaS trial. And that instantly like changed the whole game. He changed it from almost a donation model, right? It's like, hey, can I have tips to like, you need to pay to use the software. So, oh yeah, I guess he says at the end, the current MRR is 6,100 euros and growing steadily, which in Estonia, where he lives, allows him to pay himself a decent salary. So it is a full-time income. So Tracy, what's your, uh, what's your take on this story? This is a fun topic because I have a lot of friends that are in the open source industry. And I actually read this article and decided to ask a few friends. And you know, I honestly don't think that the licenses were the biggest factor here. It's actually the founder or the creator of this service moving from a, if I build it, they will come type of product to doing essentially sales, you know? Cause they talk about like raising, you know, they setting the price and they they set a way for that they can get that money in and then they increase the pricing. And it's all those kind of things that we've talked about with founders just in general about, you can't just like build something and hope that people are gonna send you money at some point some point. You have to be thoughtful about your pricing and how people are going to be using your product and do that kind of sales stuff. That was like the biggest difference. It wasn't the changing of the licenses. It was like the changing of how this person was selling and looking at the product through their own eyes. And our Volset, what are your thoughts? My thoughts is he's still probably vastly underpriced and he should probably 10x his prices overnight. That's what I think. That's what it feels like to me too. I mean, stop yeah. around here. Like he already says it in the thing, like 250 a year became 495, became 695, became 795, and finally 895. I'm like, brother, how about trying that in a zero and see how that goes? There we go. Why not? It's sales. What's the worst that could happen? Inspiring words from a man who knows SaaS pricing. Yep. That's, the t- that's part of the Tiny Seed playbook, the not so secret part of raising prices. As we move towards wrapping up, I would like to get a book recommendation from each of you. And then we're going to do a lightning round called Agree or Disagree. And it's based on the Twitter thread that I started, which is what's your most controversial opinion about building startups? I got 150 responses to that. I'm probably actually going to cover some of them in depth on a future podcast episode, but we'll bounce through some of the the spicy takes, controversial things. And I want to hear from each of you. Before we do that, Tracy Osborne, do you have a nonfiction book recommendation for folks? 
All right. So in addition to venture deals, so if you ever want to raise money or you wanted to learn about these terms and things that go into um, taking in venture capital, definitely get Venture Deals by Brad Feld. But the other one I wanted to mention is a negotiation book by Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. I I have so much trouble with negotiation. I don't like being in a position where I'm arguing against someone for my own benefit because my brain melts into a puddle and I get anxious and all that kind of stuff. And I think this book really helps redefine how negotiation works in a way that really works for my brain, where a lot of it is taking that negotiation, having empathy for the person across the table, but then using that empathy to get what you want. And that resonates with me. So it's not a fight back and forth when you're negotiating. It's like seeing it from their perspective, bringing up their that perspective to that person as you're going through the negotiation, kind of finding that middle ground. It's called Not Never Split the Difference, which I think is anti-middle ground, but it was a book that was really useful for me to kind of understand a better way of negotiation. And you also had a fiction book that you accidentally <laughs> pasted in because you misread it. You want to, we might as well just throw that out as a bonus. I read more fiction books than I do nonfiction because that was my way of turning off my brain from work. And I probably read about a book a week. Best book I've read uh, fiction-wise recently is The Anomaly by French author Hervé Letellier. Hopefully I'm saying this correctly. If anyone wants a cool fiction book with beautiful writing, I would recommend just trusting my recommendation and don't read the, the description of the book because it has a spoiler. And I think that the journey on that book is worth it to start completely scratch. Make sure you go through the first five chapters. It's going to seem weird in the beginning, but I think it's worth it. And I think it's a good way to turn your brain off of business and read something fun and be transported to another world. And our role set, what's your book recommendation? Oh, given that Tracy somehow managed to put three in there, um, I'm going to push with a combination of things. So um, I really like The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin, which is, he was this uh, chess wonder kid uh, who also ended up becoming like the world number two or world champion in some sort of an Asian fight sport thing that I don't exactly recall now. He's a very interesting guy. He's this consultant to high performance now. And he talks about his approach to learning and like how he how he how he coaches people on that. So I really like that one. And it's also just a good story. Like it's it's pretty biographical about his about his growing up and his, you know, him him going through both the chess and the martial arts world. That one's good. And then I like a more philosophical book, which is David Deutsch's uh The Beginning of Infinity, which doesn't really have any takeaways, shape or form, particularly as it relates to B2B SaaS. It's just an interesting way to think about the world that I that I think counters a lot of the I think there's an inherent negativity bias in the world in general. Like people are pretty convinced that finally now here we are, it's going to end very soon because we're all shit, versus this is sort of the opposite and antidote to that. So, so I like that a fair bit. Well, since you each gave a few recommendations, I won't give one this week. People have heard enough from me. I had one, but I'll table it for now. Now I want to lightning round this. Agree or disagree with these controversial opinions about building startups We'll start with Tracy. It's from Dominic Mon. Most developers get a better deal sitting it out in big tech, meaning instead of becoming a founder, sitting it out and working for, you know, Fang or something. What do you think? I mean, is money the only thing that matters or mm. is working on something that's interesting and challenging and having time freedom and all those other things? Like, it's like... Big tech works if you want to just make a whole bunch of money and then potentially be in a situation where you're working on nine to five and that's it. But startups and they're riskier, but it might be more challenging and more fun in different ways. Anar, what do you think? Most devs get a better deal sitting it out in big tech. Yeah, financially speaking, most likely, yes. I think I think the expected uh, financial outcome for the, the median one probably is probably higher, particularly if you get a job at the FANG when, you know, in Silicon Valley, those kind of US type salaries. Yeah, I think so. And what you don't get necessarily is the uh, is sort of the freedom to do your own thing and potential for a significantly higher outcome that you most likely to get in FANG. Next tweet is from our very own Anar Volset. Product-led growth is where founders too scared to do sales go to hide. Tracy, what's your what's your <laughs> lightning round take on this? I mean, I'm drinking the tiny seed Kool-Aid at this point. So that comes straight from Anar. I can't disagree with him. <laughs> yep. Anar, you care to elaborate on this? No, I just agree with myself. I think it's a very wise thing to say. Like I think in general, this Twitter, this Twitter account really truly is just, you know 
quality after quality tweet. Non-stop. Where's the thumbs down? It, it's next to the heart. There should be a thumbs down. I want to dislike <laughs> this tweet just because you There's said a mute that. Button, this yeah. relates to the open source stuff where, you know, there's folks who want to build something and are like, if I build it, people will come. Ooh, product-led growth. My product is going to be so amazing that people are going to be, you know, throwing themselves at me to pay me money. Where, as we've seen with many, many companies in Tiny C, that marketing and sales is incredibly important. Yeah. And I think, I mean, like to elaborate just a little bit more, like fundamentally, what I'm trying to say here is like, I don't think people realize that how consultanty like sales really is. Like, how you can't just throw things up there and like be like, hey, go use it whenever. The probably the highest value SaaS businesses actually requires the kind of sales which almost looks like consulting. That's what I think a lot of the time. Our next take is from MicroConf attendee and speaker James Kennedy. His take is, it is not actually that hard, implying that building a startup is not actually that hard. Tracy. What's your take? <laughs> that is a, it's a, just the bold, <laughs> I guess when you look at, <laughs> bold, statement. <laughs> bold statement, when you look at something, again, in hindsight, yeah, I will, I'll go back to looking at my startup and I look at back at what I did with Wedding Lovely, compressing those nine years all together, I would agree that it wasn't that hard, but the day-to-day stuff can feel like the worst thing in the world. You can go through those dips that it does feel like it's it's harder than anything else that you've done because you're having a bad day, things aren't going well. And so I think it's like long-term perspective. It doesn't, it can feel not as hard, but in the short term, it's really hard to tell people that. Anar, what's your take? I, I, I disagree with James here. I think it's extremely hard. <laughs> I think mentally more than anything else. Like I, I see that with founders and, you know, we support discretion and tiny seed. And it's just, it's a mental roller coaster in a way that just going to work and, this, just the stress of it too, particularly once you start having employees that you feel like you've got to look after and all that stuff. Yeah, it's. I think it's hard. It evolves. It's hard to say like that hard because you're looking at everything, but like the, all the, like getting from zero to one is a challenge and then scaling that is a challenge. And then working with employees is a challenge. Then, you know, jumping into enterprise sales can be the next challenge. Then having your mindset right so you can sell your company is also a challenge. All those things do add up. I think in general, like people underestimate i think a lot of the time people think like oh as soon as i get to like a million in arr or whatever number or some there's some hurdle then it'll just be coasting and just executing more versus uh, that's not the case like there's always fresh things start again add new things all the time in order to keep keep growth up so do, do two of you know the definition of a lightning round you're not supposed to go back and forth you're supposed to just yeah, weigh in yeah, with a yeah, quick yeah. thought Forever. and then we we like i'm not i'm never doing a lightning Forever. round again with you two i'm gonna replace the, i mean the, to be fair this is lightning round compared to our normal it discussions. really so really you know <laughs> yeah i'm glad you did this you know come on this is we like super talking. Fast. <laughs> our final lightning round is a tweet from caesar Hal- halmasian Startups are a trap. Lifestyle businesses are way better. Tracy, are startups a trap and lifestyle businesses way better? I don't like going first. If I'm going to be truly lightning round, <laughs> I want to hear Anar go first. Anar. No. <laughs> you said hey, lightning. Care, no. care to elaborate or shall we just move on to? No, I mean, I think our startups are a trap. No, our lifestyle is way better. It depends what you're optimizing for. You know, like if what you want to do is just sort of futz around and, uh, you know, start seven different an info product and some e-commerce dropshipping thing and a couple of SaaSs and buy something and a newsletter that you monetize and just to start, if that's what you're happy doing, that's great. But like if what you're wanting to do is, is something bigger, like make most likely more money, then startups can definitely be the way. But there are different ways to do that too, right? You're not going to, there's a difference between bootstrapping a SaaS business that you're hoping to sell for 20 million bucks compared to starting OpenAI, where apparently you're going to raise $7 trillion and, you know, build silicon in the, in the desert, right? They're, they're just different things. I don't think anything is better. I, I think it's a good thing that Elon Musk decides that he's going to, you know, build Tesla and go to Mars or whatever. Like, that's fine. It just is what it is for him. There's no, there's no better or worse, I don't think. Yeah, I've done both, right? I've had great lifestyle businesses. I've had what I would consider startups. I mean, I would have considered like Tiny Seeds a startup, MicroConf startup, Drip certainly was. And uh, I, I fall into the startup camp. Like lifestyle business is great and it got a little boring and just working 10 hours a week for, you know, making my, my money was, um, I wanted something to, where I could be more ambitious about it and where I could really have a, a purpose around it. And that I think is, is what 
the startups that I've chosen to build have brought in addition to, uh, to monetary rewards that were far beyond the lifestyle businesses. Lifestyle businesses in the short term, of course, you're making income net profit on it. It's taxed at income tax rates. And if you exit a startup, right, you, usually depending on where you live, you get that long-term cap gains and you accelerate, you know, you get 10 years of net profit, 20 years of net profit if uh, I'm talking SaaS, but it depends on multiples and such, but you can really accelerate that earning. Tracy, Closing thoughts on this tweet. Ditto. Nailed it. <laughs> nice. I just wanted to go. I just wanted Boom. to go there. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Anar Vol said, "Folks want to keep up with you." Anar Vol said on Twitter, "You work on Tiny Seed. You also are the principal of Discretion Capital. So if someone's listening to this and they have a SaaS company doing at least two million ARR. Yeah. And they're thinking about selling. You're a sell side M and A advisory, and uh, they should reach out to you." Anar at discretioncapital.com. They are pretty sure. Tracy Makes, you are Tracy Makes on Twitter. So your name is Tracy Osborne, so everyone knows, but I call it your nickname is Tracy Makes. So you, that is... Because I could not, <laughs> couldn't get Tracy Osborne on Twitter. So I am now Tracy Makes. Yes. Tracy yes. Makes on Twitter, tinyseed.com. Anywhere else you want to send folks? I'm probably more active on the tiny, the tiny Seed social media accounts than I am on my personal one. So if you're ever talking with Tiny Seed Fun on Twitter, that is me. Uh, I am also on, this is, I hesitate to, to mention this because then people are going to look at it, but I am also trying to get a TikTok account off the ground and I couldn't get Tracy Mix for that one. So I am just in time for it to be banned. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I need to get better at doing videos. So if it gets banned right after you launch yes. this, then I'm going to blame you. I'm okay. going to say, Tracy, you brought down yeah, TikTok. Yeah, my, my, little startup talking about negotiation and other little videos I'm doing took it all down. But it's, it's Tracy Makes on TikTok because that is another place I did not get my preferred username. Oh, so it's I-T-S. Tracy so it's, it's Tracy yep, Makes on, on TikTok. TikTok. Yep. Amazing. And if, if folks, if you're not following me at Rob Walling on Twitter and sasplaybook.com these days is uh, probably my most recent effort that you should check out. Tracy, thanks for joining me for this Hot Tech Tuesday. Always fun. a &R, thanks for coming around, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Tracy and a &R for joining me on this week's episode. And thank you for listening this week and every week. This is Rob Walling signing off from episode 707. Mm -hmm.